few minutes after 10 o'clock, but uh, uh, good to see. We have a good uh, delegation of, of people joining us today, both in person. I'm not sure what uh, our online presence is, but uh, welcome. It's good to have people joining us today. And I'm going to suggest to start that we maybe start with introductions. Uh, because we've got a good group of people here. We'll start with Neil and we'll just go around the, the uh, circle and include people in the audience as well, please. Yeah, it's good to see uh, all these people out. Neil Johnson, Division 10, around Brooks. Good morning, Amanda Philpott, Duchess area. Good morning, uh, Greg Screever, Division 5, uh, Lake New Resort and Castles. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kelly Chrisman. I'm from Division 6, which is on the west side of the county. Good morning again. Arnold Erickson. I'm the Reeve of the County from Division 9 in the gym area. Good morning. Nat Fenske, County Administrator. Welcome, Holly Johnson, Division 4, Scandia, Rainier, and Bow City. Good morning, Adina Scandrup, Division 2, Tilly area. Good morning and welcome. Dan Short from Division 1, Rolling Hills. Thank you. And we have Ellen Unruh is online. Uh, welcome, Ellen. Uh, Lynette Kopp is excused for today's meeting. She's attending a conference in Strathmore on behalf of the county. Let's maybe just uh, begin with staff and go around the, here, and then we'll invite uh, our guests to introduce themselves as well. Go ahead. Good morning, Carla Groom. I'm a practicing student from Medicine High College. Cheryl Page, Planning and Development Administrative Assistant. Arianna Nielsen, Executive Assistant. Sandra Stanway, Brooks Bulletin. Hi, I'm Jeff Kissam. I manage the Planning, Development, and Engineering Department. Hello, I'm Zachary Forrest, Intern for Planning and Development. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lane Johnson has a microphone and we'll circulate it so people can introduce themselves to the public record. Oh. Really? <laughs> uh, do I push the button? Oh, it's no, okay. you can just speak Sorry. into it. I'm, I'm not a tech. I have a teacher's voice, so I don't usually have to use the mic. I'm Colette Lieber. Uh, I'm in Division 5. Thank you. My name is Terry Ball. I'm in Duchess. Sherry Johnston, uh, Division 10. Uh, Daryl Douglas, I'm just here with Newell Colony. Iron O'Toole for Newell Colony. I'm Charlie uh, for Remedy. Uh, this is Anna from Bosco. Ming from Remedy. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Hofer from Newell Colony. George from Newell Colony. Ken Glasser. Please, Barney. Al Pedal Terry. Shanna Lee with the County of Newell. Jessica Getz from Castle. Carlotta Weirstra, Castle. Debbie Axelson, Scandia. Mary Lou Bensey, Tilly. Cecilia Watson, Duchess. Okay. Welcome everyone. Good to have a good uh, turnout this this morning. Um, we have no one. Or uh, Lynette Kopp is excused from the meeting as counselor. She is, as I indicated before, attending a care conference for us in Strathmore today. So we should get a motion from council to excuse um, Lynette. Holly, go ahead. I make the motion to excuse Lynette from today's meeting. Thank you. All in favor, please indicate. That's carried. Thank you. With that, uh, we will need a motion to adopt the minutes. I'm going to uh, of the previous meeting. That's the February 9th, 2023 meeting. Are there any errors, or omissions, or changes that need to be made to those minutes, or not seeing any a motion to approve those minutes? Adina, please. I'll make that motion to approve. Thank you. All in favor of approval of the previous minutes. But it's carried. Thank you. We move to post agenda items. Are there any post agenda items that anyone is aware of that need to be added to our agenda? Neil, go ahead. Uh, just one kind of information in the 
chamber's list of grants, there's a grant available to help people get conservation easements, which is kind of contrary to the opinion this council has. Wherever you want to go with it, it's fine. But information. Just an information item that we'll discuss on part of Coast Agenda. Thanks, Neil. Anything else? The other thing I'm going to suggest is to, today we do have um, a, a delegation in with the Alberta Utilities Commission at 11 and the Canadian Renewable Energy Association at 11:30, and I, I'm not sure what people's agenda or uh, timeline is, but but we probably will have people attending that. I'm going to suggest that we defer question period till after that because there may be questions from the public that 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 could be related to that too, and I think that would be valuable for us. So. Uh, I'm going to suggest that our agenda moves question period to uh, just prior to our break at noon, right? Any other agenda items that need to be changed? Or a motion to adopt the agenda as uh, adjusted? Amanda, please. Make that motion. Okay. All in favor of approving the agenda as amended? That's carried. Thank you. With that, we'll go to item number seven, bylaws. Uh, Bylaw 7 and article or agenda item 7.1, bylaw 2049 2323, land use amendment 004. Uh, it's here for first reading, and I'll go to staff for that. Zachary, are you taking that, or Jeff? Zachary, go ahead. Yes, I'll be taking this this morning, and Maria's absent. So the purpose of this application is to redesignate. Uh, I get you to speak right into the mic and speak as clearly as possible, just so that it so it resonates well. Thanks. For sure. Thank you. The purpose of this application is to redesignate a 104.73 acre portion of the southwest 42318 west of 4, as shown in the attached map, from Agri Agriculture General District to Industrial General District. For recommendation here is for first reading to be given and for public hearing to be set for March 23rd, 2023. The subject parcel is in Division 6, 14 kilometers north of the town of Bassano. All the parcels surrounding the proposed location are in the Agricultural General Land Use District. The closest residence is two kilometers away from the location and belongs to the applicant. The Industrial General District would allow for the construction of a Class II non-hazardous waste landfill. The Class II landfill requires approval by Alberta Environment and Parks under the Alberta Environment Protection and Enhancement Act to accept non-hazardous industrial waste and non-dangerous oil field waste. The applicant has stated that the landfill would not be approved for, to accept residential slash municipal waste, liquids, or hazardous materials. The primary waste drains for the proposed facility would be waste generated in the oil and gas industry as a result of the drilling, regular operations, and decommissioning activities. If the land use land bylaw is passed, the applicant can apply for the development permit for the landfill and move forward with AEP approval. So the response options are one, the council will provide first reading to the bylaw, two, that council deny the bylaw, or three, that council will table the first reading of the bylaw to a future meeting. It's important to note here that if first reading is given to bylaw 2049-23, that the public hearing will be advertised to allow adjacent landowners and affected parties the ability to comment on the proposed amendment. Um, and we'll take any questions now, and I'd like to say that the landowners are here to answer questions, if there are any. Okay, thank you. We have the bylaw before us. Are there any questions uh, for staff or the landowners? Uh, Greg and then Kelly, please. So as far as... Uh, um, non-hazardous industrial waste and non-dangerous oil field waste. What, what kind of waste is that? Do you have any okay, exam if examples? Someone, of that kind if of someone uh, from the group that wants to answer that, please come up and take the mic so that uh, all of us and everyone out in the electronic media can hear you. Uh, I'm Charlie from Redex. So regarding to the waste kind of waste that you're talking about, it will be mainly uh, hydrocarbon contaminated soil from, let's say, uh, 
contaminated sites from oil and gas activities. That will made up maybe 70 to 80 percent of the waste type that will be coming into the landfill. Okay, thank you. Uh, follow up, Greg. And that's uh, non-dangerous. Is that yes. is that the classification of that yes. is non-dangerous? So it would be contaminated soil. Is it being reclaimed at the site also, or or what's happening with that soil? Just being stored, or what what happens to that soil when it when it goes there? Yes, it's well, it's landfill, so it will be stored there. Uh, uh, yes, for the for as long as the uh, the generator is uh, is still liable of the of the of the waste that's coming into the landfill. So, okay, thank you, Kelly. Sorry about that. Um, so um, I think um, Arnold, this question is for you. Um, Arnold has been um, calling and um, informing me of your progress. Um, so this is the colony diversifying. Would that be correct? Into a new in industry. Yes. Great. That's that sounds good. And this is the feeling probably because of the paved highway that goes right by your site. Would that be right? Good. All right. I uh, research, and if you're ready for a motion, I would be willing to make that motion. I will accept that, and then further questions if there are any, but uh, we have a motion on the table for, to approve first reading of, of uh, bylaw 2049-23. Any further questions, Neil? That just one to the colony. Do you own most of the land within that two and a half miles to the nearest neighbor? The stewards okay with this? Cool. Yeah, uh, Arnold, would you mind taking the mic to answer the questions if if uh, if there are any? Thank you. I I have not talked to Stewart about this. I did talk to Robert Lassiter and uh, George Baxter, but I guess uh, I can, we can call Stuart. I, I think it might be useful, but I think just in terms of understanding the process, this, the motion before us is to approve, approve first reading and there will be opportunity for the community or anyone uh, around the area to comment and get more information if they'd like to. That's the process. First reading just puts this on the table, basically, and invite and and as indicated, there will be public hearing on March 23rd if this is approved. So, so that isn't a requirement, but I think it's 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 just a good idea to to en engage the neighbors in, in whatever's happening. But I think I think that's all within process. So that's that's probably good. Does that answer your question well enough, Neil? Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. I think it's a good idea. Uh, Holly, please. I just wanted a clarification about the soil. So, um, is this soil is a combination? Because sometimes all the soil is burned when the hydrocarbons and the, they're so saturated in the soil. So, is a mix of burned soil and contaminated soil, or is this maybe contaminated? I'll please come back for the, to the mic. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question again? My experience has been sometimes the oil companies actually burn the soil because it's so saturated with oil and sometimes they just haul it to a landfill. So is it a combination of both kinds of dirt you would be accepting or just the, um, the soil that is not just saturated, I guess, or just... Uh, we won't accept any, any waste that is flammable over, that can be flammable under 45 degrees uh, Celsius. So basically the, the waste that we're, we're accepting will not be available. Thank you. Okay. Arnold, just, oh, Kelly, you've got another question? I just um, realized I'm proposing, or I'm moving option one, by the way, just for Great. clarity. Great. Thank you. That's what we will uh, act on. Arnold, just a question. I mean, basically this is a commercial enterprise that is in response to demand from the oil and gas sector for further development and, and an, an opportunity to 
economically and locally dispose of, of soil that needs to be disposed of, right? And and I think certainly from uh, we'll we'll that that's clear in terms of our understanding of what the initiative is here, right? If, 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 yes. Good. Good. I think that's good information. Are we ready for the questions? All in favor of the motion to pass first reading, please indicate. Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Thanks for your uh, attendance here to answer questions today and we look forward to further development that happens because of, of this and there will be a public hearing opportunity to respond to it. So thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to. We'll, we'll, uh, we have delegations beginning at 11 with the AUC. Uh, I'm going to suggest that we move to item nine on our agenda: administrative business. And first of all, a policy review of policy uh, 014-23, restricted surplus. And I'll refer to Matt to take us through that, please, Matt. You bet. So uh, I'm tag teaming with uh, Stephanie today. I'll take you through the restricted surplus policy review, and then Stephanie is going to take you through some year-end bookkeeping, housekeeping items. So. Uh, Council's aware we've been going through a review of all of our policies. Restricted surplus policy is in front of you with some recommended edits. Um, this policy first came into being back in 2012. Prior to that time, uh, a number of restricted surplus funds came into being. There were about 22 uh, separate funds when I came to work at the county, which were really quite onerous to uh, manage. Uh, back in 2012, we cut the number down from 22 to nine, significantly streamlined the administration of the funds. Uh, the policy was updated again in 2017 when we started allocating funds for the replacement of recreation facilities. Uh, so that added the recreation fund. And just a, a note here, the use and management of restricted surplus funds within the framework of a formalized restricted surplus policy is a best practice and consistent feature of most well-managed municipalities in Canada. So what have we recommended for changes here? Uh, really condensing the policy guidelines, standards, roles and responsibilities. Previous policy referred to a manager of finance, which uh, we were able to eliminate, so now we're putting the controller in place for uh, being responsible for the accounting on these funds. Uh, we're looking at simplifying the administration of the funds. Uh, so every opportunity we get where it makes sense to reduce the number, I'm really wild about reducing the number of these funds because there is some back-end accounting that has to take place for these. So you'll see we're recommending that we toss the unexpended budget appropriation fund. And just to remind council, that fund was set up for uh, capturing some of the activity that we had planned on doing in a year but never got around to. So if we had planned to uh, pave a new road and we were going to fund that from taxes in a given year and we didn't get that done in the year it was budgeted, we would sock that money away into the unexpended budget appropriation fund so that it's available in the next year to fund the project. Kind of a carry forward account. All of the things that we've carried forward don't always get funded in the next year, not in the amounts required. This is really some, what I would consider, busy accounting work. Um, so what we're proposing is we remove that. We can still put the carry forward funding into a reserve, but we'd put it into, if it was for a, a vehicle, we'd put it in the vehicle's machinery and equipment fund. If it was for paving the roads, we'd put it into the paving fund instead of this catch-all unexpended budget appropriation fund. Uh, so recommended removing that. We've removed this triennial policy review standard. I think we've got to a place where we're trying to get through all policies during each council term. Um, adjusting the minimum level for the fire fund. We had uh, $250,000 in there as a minimum, which really is not sufficient to do much of anything when you have to spend a half million dollars on a uh, fire engine, so we bumped that up to 100% uh, of the accumulated amortization balance to the county's fire apparatus. Um, 
Fire's been an interesting service area over time as the fire associations have all come under the county umbrella. We've slowly taken, uh, taken in the fire engines, uh, bought bush buggies. Now that most of that fleet is under our care, we have that accumulated amortization balance building up. And that's at least uh, a minimum standard that I think is reasonable and rational to uh, have that level of funds in the policy. Um, other changes here to highlight, we have indicated that the regional enhancement fund will be closed once those remaining funds are uh, expended and Stephanie and her report following will uh, provide the details of what's left in there. Uh, that fund is really a legacy fund that predates all the intermunicipal collaboration framework agreements that we have in place now with our partners. So there, once that money is spent, it's we're covered for the, the collaboration. It doesn't mean that we're done enhancing the region. We're still doing that, but it's through uh, our ICF agreements. Um, with that, I've spoken long enough about this policy, open to questions, and we're recommending uh, approval as presented. Thanks, Matt. Are there any questions? Greg, please. Thanks, Matt. Um, I have one question. Uh, when the money is carried forward, forward into the capital expenditure in reserve for the next day, if the project wasn't done and it was sent forward to a next year for to be done the year later or two years later, is that um, is that money invested and do we get do we get any interest on that money? Uh, is it actual physical money? And also, does uh, does that how does that account for inflation? So we've seen pretty incredible inflation the last year. It, does the investment keep up with the inflation, basically? That's a great question. I don't think last year the investments kept up with inflation at all, kind of a thing, right? So uh, that was another standard we had in the old policy is, you know, for those restricted surplus funds which are supported by, by cash balances, that we would do the accounting entry and credit them for a prorated share of the uh, bond coupons, the interest earned on it. That again was busy accounting work in my mind. Stephanie will walk you through the restricted surplus policy where we compare what we've got in the piggy bank to the minimum standards that we have. And you'll see, you know, when we end the year with a surplus, we'll do what Stephanie's gonna do next then make recommendations where to put those surplus funds. Um, so short answer, no. All of your restricted surplus balances are not supported by cash. Um, a lot, there's, there's probably about five million that's supported through a long-term receivable, local improvement taxes receivable. Um, so when Stephanie says you're sitting on $124 million in restricted surplus, that doesn't mean you have $124 million today. Uh, yeah, to, to access, right? Because most of that money is in our long-term investment portfolio. Um, and if council looks at the quarter four financial information package, you'll see the years that those funds are uh, too mature kind of thing. So there's a lot of moving parts with the restricted surplus, and it all comes back to asset management and our plan for trying to maintain the level of service that we have in the county. So we pave a road, and we know once we've paved a road, we've got a commitment 20 years from, from then to overlay the road. Uh, and we're always trying to manage what we take from taxes, set aside in reserve, and uh, have it all take out so we're not vulnerable to having to uh, make decisions about, well, we can't actually afford to overlay the road. Do we tear it apart and turn it back to gravel? Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, Neil, please. Does this make it, it uh, I'm not sure how to word it. This gives us more flexibility so we don't have slush funds building up because things change from year to year. Just because we decide to do it this year doesn't mean you're going to do it next year or ever. So does it give you more flexibility into moving that money around and doing and making it work for us? 
I don't know that it gives us more flexibility. It maintains the flexibility that we have. And especially with the elimination of that unexpended budget fund, it removes some non-value added accounting steps, right? So uh, we had that unexpended budget fund since 2012. And our experience has been uh, a lot of the items that get carried forward aren't fully spent. Some of the projects aren't ever complete. And then you just have this balance hanging out for a few years. So we're saying close that out, uh, put the money in the fund that it truly belongs to, the paving, vehicles, equipment, what have you. That's, that's perfect. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Greg, you've done them? I'm ready to make the motion. Okay, I just have one more question, just for an in, for instance, Matt, with regard to adjusting the minimum level for the fire fund, you indicated 250000 is probably a little low, and I realize that that number will change. But just for a, for a, and a, for example, what would what would that come to currently, let's say, uh, to make this change? And oh. yeah, uh, maybe that's yeah, you're, you're, you're testing me. It's, I, it's coming next, absolutely. but it's uh, okay. 907503 Okay, that's good. Thanks. Okay, we have a motion to... Uh, Approve uh, policy 014-23. Seeing no further questions, all in favor of the motion, please indicate. That is carried. Thank you. And with that, let's move to item 9.1.1, uh, motion for policy. Sorry, we did that. Uh, motion, uh, pardon me, um, item 9.2, restricted surplus review and approval of year-end transfers. And uh, uh, we'll go to Stephanie, our controller, please. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Welcome to everybody uh, that's uh, watching this. Um, so this time of year, after we have finished our year-end entries, uh, we come to council uh, to present a uh, year-end transfer that we would like to do regarding our restricted surplus. And as Matt has mentioned, um, he's given you some overview of the restricted surplus. And uh, this entry now will reflect the new policy that you have just approved. And so um, maybe just to give some people a background, uh, the restricted surplus is one of the components of the county's accumulated surplus. Uh, the accumulated surplus represents the county's net worth or the net resources available to provide future services. Uh, restrictions identify surplus funds for specified future pur purposes as set out by council through the policy, policy being the one that you just approved. Um, restricted surplus consists of both cash and not cash components, as Matt previously mentioned, and does not represent 100% of liquid funds that could be used to support the projects today. So what we're really doing is we're taking the surplus that we have uh, come up with with our year-end entries and we're going to be putting it towards future purchases for the county. Um, so if you look at the RFD that we're presenting, uh, we show that we want to put 9.5 million towards the infrastructure fund, which that then will be used for future infrastructure projects that the council uh, approves during the annual budget process. We are removing the money that was in the unexpected, unexpended budget fund as Matt presented in the previous policy, and we're moving some money around from the future project funds just to make it a bit easier for us for accounting purposes uh, with our projects. So on this one slide here, it will show you a summary of the 2022 restricted surplus funds um, as it will be once we do this entry if council approves it, showing you what we'll have for future uh, spending on the particular fund. So these are restricted. So what is in here is only meant to be for these particular projects. So what is in vehicle machinery and equipment fund will be for the replacement of machinery, not to build a road. 
Um, also, as Matt mentioned, uh, as we were moving some stuff around, uh, you will have in the future project fund $3.66 million. And those are already restricted for these particular projects, such as the Brooks Regional Airport, uh, new building uh, to refresh the council chambers, gravel pit reclamation, gravel crush, landfill, and to pay uh, our water to venture payment. As mentioned, we are looking towards um, closing out the regional enhancement fund. We currently have $60,000 left to commit for future funds. Everything else in here has already been committed to be spent on such things such as the uh, City of Brooks pathway allocation, uh, the special areas, Mosasaur project that was previously approved in the interim 2023 budget. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> That's a lot of numbers here. Okay. Thanks, Stephanie. They are. Thank you for that presentation. We do have Paul. Go ahead. You've got a question. I'm just curious about the allocations for Division Six and Nine. I know they're, they're allocated there under the Regional Enhancement Fund balance, but I don't see any plans for that money. They've been sitting there for quite some time. So, is that money actually planned expenditures? Or is it going to wait until Division Six and Nine have plans to use it? I think it's there. Um, it's already been previously committed, but I don't think there's any particular project that has been assigned to it. So it is there for if something come up for Division 6 and 9, we could use that money from the Regional Enhancement Fund for it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Oh, <laughs> good luck. Um, any other questions? Matt, did you have more to add? No, that's good. Thanks, Stephanie. Any further? Uh, Greg, please. So as far as the rec boards go, if there's a uh, um, money that uh, we choose or is allocated to the rec board and that project isn't started, does it go into this under the recreation fund? Is that is that where that money goes, Matt? Or there are separate liability accounts that hold uh, unspent balances there for the rec boards. Uh, thank you, Matt. Dan, please. What's going to happen to that $60,000 that's available to commit? Does somebody apply to get that, or does it just sit in limbo, or do we move it to a new account? Go ahead, Matt, please. Those are all possibilities. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's there available to commit. So, you know, when council's approached by a group who might have a project with regional benefits, that's a potential funding source for it. Uh, yeah, a lot of these balances has, have been carried forward, as Councillor Johnson mentioned, for, for several years. Um, you know, a potential use for Div 6 and Div, Div 9 allocation balances might be for the pool liner replacement in Bassano, which will be coming to you soon. Um, that could be one potential. If the groups in Div 6 and Div 9 have special projects they're looking to entertain, uh, they could make applications for those funds as well. So it's pretty broad, that regional enhancement fund. Thank you. And and Division 6 and Division 9 would have, would they have some say in it or basically some influence, um, notwithstanding if there are no projects in the area, I suppose, right? Ultimately, it's a uh, council who, who decides where, where those go. So if community groups came with an application, council as a whole would decide. Um, through, through the budget process, if there were projects that looked to be good candidates for the use of these funds, council could make that decision at, at that time as well. But uh, no, we don't send uh, these recommendations to like the rec boards of, of the area. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Someone ready to make a motion? Uh, Adina, please. I will make a motion that we go ahead with option one and uh, do the year-end transfer of unrestricted funds. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? All in favor of approval of the motion, please indicate. 
Hold, that's carried, thank you. Okay, thank you. With that, we'll move to item number 9.3 on our agenda. Electoral Division Boundaries Committee Engagement Initiative, and I'll go to Lane Johnson, our Director of Corporate Services, please. Lane and Roberto. Good morning. Good morning. So this item has been subject of discussion with this council on a couple of previous occasions. We're here before council this morning to discuss primarily two different things. One is the content that we're wanting to focus on during the community engagement initiative where we're inviting feedback from the public on the issue that is before council for consideration this morning. The other is on the process itself, the steps that we're proposing to use to reach out, to share information, uh, give people details that they need to provide responses and how we collect those responses back and report back to council with the positions that have been shared by the public. So those are the two primary things that we're wanting to focus on. Um, Can I interrupt for one a question, uh, Holly? Okay. So I got a call before we talk about the actual questions we're asking. I got a call from a rate payer last night, a quarter to ten, who reviewed the agenda and said that Lane's, what you were presenting was not correct because Kelly's motion, they'd watched the, the, the uh, county videos, and Kelly's motion back on Jan 12th was much more specific than what you were addressing. So I went back and watched the meeting last night and I wrote down what Kelly's said because it does affect what we're doing. So Kelly said my motion is to take this to our public, getting their input on redrawing divisional lines to make our numbers more proportionate to each other. Arno said with 10 councillors and Kelly said 10 councillors. Um, oh sorry, no, her first count, so I'll go back. Her first motion was council to public engagement was electronic and paper, getting ratepayers' opinion on the discussion. On I guess we need to be more defined than that. We need to take two or three proposals to redrawing our divisional lines. That's my motion. And then Kelly said, well, then there was a little discussion and Kelly said her motion is to take this to our public, getting their input on redrawing divisional lines to make our numbers more proportionate to each other. Arno said with 10 councillors, Kelly said 10 councillors. There was discussion and Matt talked about to find there was an appetite in the public um, to spend resources on electoral boundaries. And Kelly then said, um, okay, I, I withdraw my motion. My new motion is to get the electoral's opinion on how big a priority for 10 divisions, I want to be clear. So listening to that, I realized that we are incorrect in what we're looking at because the motion was not to look at how many divisions there would be. Kelly's motion was specific that we leave it at 10 divisions and just look at who want to redraw some boundary lines. So um, I couldn't, I found this out at like 10.30 last night going through it, so I couldn't bring it forward beforehand, but um, it does mean we can talk about the process, how we're going to do this, but the information you're asking would not be correct then, Wayne. Okay, thanks, Holly. I, um, do you have some comments, Wayne? Or, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, what we have prepared is simply in the draft form, and what we are wanting from this discussion with council this morning is direction to proceed with content. And I fully expect that after this conversation that there is going to be extensive revisions in what has been prepared. Uh, if we've gone beyond what council had originally anticipated, then so be it, we'll pull it back. But the expectation is this morning that yes, we're wanting you to provide approval to proceed with content. And what is before you is draft only, and we anticipate there is going to be revisions to it. Right, okay, and we will have options with regard to the motion that we make relative to this as well. So uh, we can probably continue, but uh, thanks for that information, Holly. I, uh, but I missed that as well. So. Uh, let's continue and then we will take that into consideration when we make a motion. I mean, this can be tabled for further information too if that's needed. So, go ahead. Thanks. 
Okay, so as I was saying, there's two different things that we're wanting to discuss with council this morning. One is content, and the other is approach for engaging with the public. Uh, obviously, from the comments that have already been shared, we need to go back and revise the content, and certainly prepared to do that. But the other is on the process that we would anticipate using in order to get that information out there to the public. What we are hoping to do as far as the process goes is to piggyback on this initiative with information that relates to, to a couple of different apps that we would like to make use of in getting information out there and receiving feedback from the public. Those apps are Newell Connect and Newell Notify. And what we have prepared is um, information that we would propose to include in the mail out that also provides an overview on those apps and then encourages the public to make use of those apps to respond to the request for feedback that um, we're going to be approaching the public about. So with that as the foundation for the discussion, I guess what we're wanting to do is go through the, the actual content uh, of the information that would be shared Obviously, from what Councillor Johnson has indicated, we do need to go back and rework it and focus strictly on um, inviting feedback on whether or not Council should proceed with a review of the electoral division boundaries based on 10 divisions only. If that's the decision that Council makes, that's what we will do. Okay, thank you, Lane. That, uh are there questions, comments, further direction? Uh, Neil, please, and then Holly. Yeah, this is Elaine. I think you brought this up the last meeting too. What's the? I, I don't have a problem with ten counselors. I think it's working well, but the proportion thing is something that we have to deal with because it's it's definitely not there. What were the big drawbacks to redoing the population with ten counselors? Like you said, it was very cumbersome. Uh, historically, the divisions have been based on loosely uh, defined boundaries for communities that have developed over time throughout the county. As the population has shifted, uh, those, in order to maintain 10 divisions, evenly uh, distributed populations across those 10 divisions, uh, the boundaries across those community lines that have been in place will have to be shifted significantly. Uh, there's going to be a challenge in maintaining that um, sense of community, if that's what it is, across those 10 uh, individual communities throughout, throughout the county. Okay, thank you, Lane. Uh, Holly, you had a question? Just two comments. Um, I would like to see a lot less information. I think the amount of information provided is a little bit overwhelming. Um, perhaps too much background. It's, I, I'd like to see a, a fairly simple questionnaire that doesn't confuse people. As well, I think it's important that people know there's a cost to doing this because it's taxpayer money. If we're going to do this, it's going to cost money and people need to be aware of that and make sure they want to spend their money on electoral boundaries, moving them, or whether we're good where we're at. Okay, thank you. Uh, Neil? Yeah, well, you mentioned uh, there will be a mail out with this too. I, I think that's important. Like the new will notify all our computer stuff is fantastic, but when you drive around the road from my place, 90% of them aren't going to be coming at you with a computer, but they will fill out a little bail out. Uh, yeah, I agree. There's maybe a little, a little too much information in there. Um, it's all good information and very relevant, but it gets to be uh, that sometimes it's too long, didn't read. Um, so uh, I think it could be shortened up, simplified somehow, it would be, would be great. But regardless of what the original motion was, um, if we're, if we're, we can't sit here and make the decision for, for everybody. If we're asking for feedback, 
we let's ask for feedback. Um, if we're asking them a question about redrawing boundaries, why is what's wrong with asking them if they think it should be 10, 9, 7, 5, 11, whatever? It's not right for us to make that decision preemptively. So I think we need to have that included. And if that means that we have to make a motion to include that as part of this questionnaire, I'll make that motion. But I, I don't see that that needs to come out of there. It's just because we want 10, 9, 7, or whatever individually we'd like to have. It's irrelevant. We're asking a question of the public, and this is our job to, to do so. Okay, that's perspective. Thanks, Dan, Holly, and then Kelly. I spent 45 minutes listening to our discussion last month. We decided this motion. It was a long discussion. I, I say we've made that motion after a lengthy discussion. We can, how many times we revisit it? That's why we're here to make decisions, and then we go forward and what our, what our motion was. I, I do not want to revisit it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kelly, please. So that, that was um, how I understood um, this to go as well, Dan. Um, I remember talking in depth about being, um, getting out to the public and getting them engaged in this conversation. Um, we also talked about um, sharing why, why we're um, at 10 or 9, um, because they need background information. I do agree, though, that four pages at size, what looks like size four print, <laughs> might be a little difficult. Um, if we could um, narrow that down and, and large, or um, even put some pictures in there to take some words away, you know, uh, pictures say a thousand words sometimes. Um, but this is the direction that that I had in mind, um, whether it came through or not. And um, so I too would be in favor of a motion to get that into the pro, allow it into the process as well. We're engaging the public, ask the question, that's all we're doing. Uh, just right, back in a minute. Neil, uh, I, think, I think that's good information. I think as we engage the public on this, the feedback is important. At the end of the day, it will be our decision in terms of, of how, we, how we set this up. There's been comments too about, and, and I think, Matt, I'd invite you to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, um, not like other electoral, like provincial and federal boundaries have targets in terms of population percentage represented in each each area and also uh, targeted uh, differences in population variance. The MGA, the Municipal Government Act, I believe does not uh, spell that out in terms of, of uh, municipalities. <coughs> so, so in terms of the, the, the MGA does not push us to have to do this. It will be our decision with regard to how many representatives there are in the future. I think it's valuable and significant and important that we get as much feedback as we can and invite people to comment on that. But, but I think too it would be useful to keep that as, as basic as it can be to avoid confusion because we're uh, at a time when that can happen quite easily and what we want is clear uh, perspective from people that understand what it is we're, we're talking about. And I, and I do want to really clarify that we understand that the Municipal Government Act does not require us to have uh, equal numbers of representatives represented by each division. I appreciate that, it's, that it can be important and it's significant, but I think it's also significant, and Lane, you commented on the fact that primarily our divisions have, have been around communities, and if we change too much of that, that's, that's going to get away from that principle, which can happen, it's not a, that's not a serious problem, but it does uh, change probably the culture of, of some of the organization or the representation as well. So uh, just for, by way of comment, is that accurate, Matt, in terms of what I said about the MGA? Yeah, I, when we met with uh, Minister McIver after the last uh, bylaw was defeated, we had raised this question with him, you know, the MGA isn't explicit. Would you write something in? And his comment was, "Do we have to tell you? Do we have to tell you?" Uh, he just referred to the the case law out of the Supreme Court. Plus minus twenty five percent is what they're they're looking for. So, 
it is there. Yep. It, just the case law, but not, not within the MGA itself. Okay. And it didn't sound like the minister was really eager to write it in. No, no. I, I had Neil for a question, and I'll come back to Holly. Too. Yeah, I'm just wondering, Lane, the sense of community, I understand it totally, but not for Greg and I, where most of the people are, and out in Tilly. Is it easier to manipulate that to keep that sense of community going with fewer number of counselors or maybe a couple of examples in this questionnaire? Because I, I just can't see how you can pull it off. Well, there's an endless number of options as to how many uh, or where boundaries would be drawn based on any number of electoral divisions that council wants us to pursue. Pursue. I don't know if there's a way to answer that question. Um, based on the information that's before us right now. I just, I don't, uh, I would defer on that. Well, didn't you have some boundaries drawn up pre the last election? Because I was going to run in one division or the other depending on what the outcome yeah. came. Like, would it be worth dragging them up again to let the public have a look? Like, the more information, especially in my area, because our votes count a little bit less than everybody else's. So. I have to do whatever I can to make sure that the people in my area are, are represented, same, same as you said. So the more information you get out there, whether it's seven counselors, nine counselors, 11 counselors, just some different examples would be, would be good, I think. Okay, thanks. Anything more to add, Ms. Lane? Or? It's my understanding that the fundamental question that council wants to deal with right now is whether or not you want to go through a review of the boundaries. Yeah. If we start putting in, if we include information about what those potential boundaries could be, it's going to muddy the waters extremely. Yeah, it looks like confusing. Last time through this, we had potential boundaries for seven, nine, ten. You need to decide as a council whether you want to move forward with a process. That's what you're wanting feedback from the public on. And once the public has expressed their position, then it's going to be up to council to decide if we're going through this process, how many councils are you going to base those boundaries on? Okay, okay thank you. Holly? Just wanted to say when the county lost the court case when they tried this last time, the ruling was that we are to do effective representation, not, wasn't based on numbers, it was effective was the word that was used. And secondly, Neil, yes, I took a ruler and I fixed the population problem with two lines. It's not hard. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're running up against time because we have an appointment with the Alberta Utilities Commission here in a couple of minutes. But Matt, I think you had a suggestion for a, a move forward for us on this on this uh, line item. Go ahead, Matt. Please. Yeah. So what I've heard, and Lane can uh, summarize for me as well, is uh, we need administration to boil the information package down from four pages to two pages. If the, or one page, can we get it down to a one pager? Um, so we'll do some work on condensing the information package. Uh, the number of counselors question is a live question. We can answer that in two weeks when this comes back in a more condensed format. And then I, I would also just ask council if there's other edits you would like to see, send them into administration and we'll roll that into the next uh, package that comes back to you March 9th. Okay, I think that's that makes sense to you, Lane and Roberta. Council, we're good with that. We don't have a decision to make right today, so I will refer to our next meeting. Thank you for the presentation this morning. I think it uh, carries on the discussion. Okay, we're going to take about as short a break as possible. Okay, the The meeting back to order um, and. Uh, Welcome members of the Alberta Utilities Commission that have come to make presentations uh, to us this morning. Wayne McKenzie, J.P. Mazzo, and Jeff uh, Scott are on electronically.
and uh, no, I think uh, we're good to go. Like, uh, like Arlen mentioned, uh, this is uh, was a request from council to better understand the role that the county plays in the Alberta Utility Commission approval process. Um, so we've got Wayne and and uh, his colleagues JP and Jeff here today to give a short presentation and hopefully have some time for council to ask any questions they may have. And uh, as long as uh, Wayne, you can see the slides, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Can you hear us, Wayne? And you're connected. Right. Want to jump in? Yes, go ahead, please. All right, all right. Well, thank you very much uh, for inviting us to uh, uh, speak with you uh, today. It's uh, we appreciate these opportunities to uh, uh, let you know uh, about our processes and and actually to spread the word that. Uh, we, uh, we love to see uh, the municipalities pr uh, participate in our processes. So, uh, so uh, I've, got a, I've got a short presentation. Wayne, can I, introduce, inter can I interrupt you for just a second? Two things, if you have phones, please, please turn them to silence so that they don't interrupt our meeting. And we do have a quorum, oh, pardon me, a, 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 a uh, what's the right word? Uh, no, we have a, a large delegation here as well, Wayne, just, just so they can hear you, but also we have standards of, of, of decorum here. If you're, if you're in council chambers, you need to be here without a hat on, please. So just, uh, uh, I forget to talk about that quite often, but welcome. Anyway, thanks. Go ahead, Wayne. Sorry to interrupt. Pardon me? And Wayne, if you can speak right into your mic so we can hear you. We do have a, a, a full room here this, this morning. Thanks. All right, uh, some of that I didn't catch, but uh, uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, it's, it's a little bit muted, but if... if uh... All right. Okay, go ahead and try again. You've got our volume turned right up, so... Okay, let me uh, let me let me speak loudly and, and try to uh, try to uh, uh, make sure you can hear me, and I'll speak directly into the mic, hopefully. Um, so, it's uh, we'll try to uh, we'll try to give you a quick presentation on the uh, uh, on our process, and uh, and 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 leave some time for uh, questions at the end. Uh, I know I know uh, a lot of it uh, was about sort of giving you the opportunity to, to uh, ask questions. So uh, we'll jump we'll jump in here. Uh, we've I've got with me uh, JP Musso, who's our general counsel. And I've got Jeff Scott, who's with our communications uh, group here at the uh, AUC. And uh, so again, uh, thanks for the opportunity, and uh, we'll jump right in here. So, uh, next slide, please. So, really, uh, the, the point of this slide is really to to, to get the point across that uh, uh, the commission makes uh, uh, decisions in the public interest, and part of that part of that uh, decision making process is to take into account. Uh, things like the social, economic, envir and environmental interests of Alberta. So it's it's all of those factors that uh, that play into the decision making at the commission. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of how we're uh, set up here at the uh, at the commission, uh, we have our, our commission members who are appointed by government. And uh, we have a, uh, a slot of commission members, up to uh, nine commission members. Uh, currently, we have a uh, complement of eight. eight. And, uh, and they make all of the decisions on all the applications that, that come before the commission. Part of, part of what we do as staff is, is to make sure that they have the information that they need to uh, need to make a decision. Uh, so, so we're we're here as uh, as part of staff. 
Uh, we don't. We do not speak for the commission. They speak uh, speak uh, for themselves through their decision. So we're here to provide information. We're here to talk about our process and uh, and, and answer your questions to the best we can. But but we're not speaking on on, on behalf of the commission. Uh, next slide, please. So, so what happens when uh, when we get an application for a renewable uh, project or, or or any project that comes to the commission? It's submitted. We have an, an electronic uh, a platform where the where applicants will submit uh, their their applications to us uh, through our e-filing system. It's available uh, publicly. You just have to register to uh, to gain access to that. Uh, Staff would initiate uh, the review process. It's uh, it's in, in most cases, if it's a, if it's a large project, it, it'll be uh, put out for notice, public notice. Uh, staff will uh, review the application uh, and consider uh, consider the evidence that's before us. Ask uh, information requests for clarification. And this is really where the the municipality would would factor into this process, because at this time we're looking at uh, 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 making sure the commission has the information it needs, and part of that could be the uh, input of the uh, municipality. So, so as part of the notice uh, process, we would ask parties to uh, submit. Uh, it, it, their intent to participate in the proceeding and uh, and how they may be impacted by the project. So so it's at that stage we would want to uh, hear from uh, from the county and um, and any uh, any issues they they would have uh, with a, with an application. So once so and through that process you would be able to submit evidence uh, and. Uh, and, and there may be some some uh, information requests around that evidence. So once once that process uh, sort of unfolds, uh, the application is uh, deemed complete. The commission then has uh, all the information, or should have all the information it needs to make a decision. Uh, and and that's important because the commission will make a decision on the record. Of the, the of, of all the evidence on the that's on the record of the proceeding, and and that's what it'll make its decision on. So it's important that the information is is in place at that stage. The uh, it'll then goes to decision writing, and uh, and then it'll be issued again through our electronic platform. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you a sense too. Uh, depending on the size of the uh, of the generation, uh, the level of involvement of the AUC will will differ. So for for things like micro generation, where it's someone has a solar panel on their house or uh, uh, or, or a battery pack uh, in their garage, sort of thing, that doesn't that doesn't come before the commission unless there's a uh, unless there's a complaint. Uh, but it still has to meet uh, sort of necessary conditions. And on the next slide, I'll talk about those conditions. So, so they don't require an application. They work with the uh, distribution company, and, uh, uh, but they still have to meet those conditions, and I'll talk about those. So then for, for, for power plants that are under one megawatt, uh, they do not require an application to uh, to the AUC, and then power plants sort of one megawatt to under ten megawatts. It's really uh, it's really a, a, a smooth process. It's a checklist application, and again, they have to confirm or attest that conditions are met. And so, so that something like that would be turned around in uh, five business days or less. Uh, we have. Other categories where it could be a designated small or a community generator, uh, small generator that that is seeking to be a community generation and has a uh, has a benefits agreement with the, with the uh, with a, a community uh, based association or the community itself uh, and uh, at, and and they would receive 
uh, approval from the commission for, on that basis. And then lastly, it comes down to a full application uh, with the, uh, to the AUC. They would look to our rule seven, uh, which outlines all the requirements that they have to meet to file an application. And, uh, and that, would, uh, that would follow sort of the process that I outlined uh, just earlier there, it's the, um, uh, once an application is received. So that sort of gives you the, the scope of, uh, of applications that can uh, come before the commission. Uh, most, of the, uh, most of the projects uh, where we would see uh, uh, municipalities get involved is, is on the last one where, where it's a full-scale full uh, application and uh, review by the AUC. Uh, generally over um, a 10, 10 megawatt project. Next slide, please. And so in terms of the conditions, uh, the necessary conditions uh, at, the, uh, at the smaller scale of a project, whether that's microgeneration or, or between one and 10 megawatts, uh, or and even under one megawatt, the conditions have to be that no person is directly and adversely affected. Uh, the power plant must comply with our rule 12, which is our noise control rule. So it has to meet certain uh, permissible sound levels uh, and there's no adverse effect on the environment. So an applicant, even though they, uh, the, the, the requirements for an application are not the same. They still must meet these necessary conditions. And the last one is, is they must uh, work with the, the local distribution uh, company to, uh, to connect their project. And, uh, and meet the um, okay sorry and okay, we lost you from about when you sleep when you covered the fourth plank of the slide you know. okay sorry uh so the so the fourth point really is just they they, they must in company to connect their project if if they're uh, uh, sort of a micro generation or a small uh, uh, small power generation, uh, and it's really just so so that they uh, connect. So to the four conditions that they must meet uh, can connect safe. Uh, the uh, there's the level of detail in the application is is not uh, um, is not high. All right, next slide. So there's, there's three main rules uh, at the commission that if, uh, if an applicant is, is, is coming before us, uh, they must uh, look to the rule and meet the requirements that are set out in the rule. So the primary rule is our rule seven, and that's applications for power plants, substations, transmission lines, industrial system designations, uh, hydro developments and gas utility pipelines. So it, that uh, that lays out the requirements for all for our applicants and under the power plants we have it separated out by uh, by power plant type so whether it's solar wind or thermal you could go specifically to that to that area and uh, and see what uh, re what requirements you have to meet under that rule we also lay out uh, the requirements for a uh, participant involvement program. So how that uh, uh, company will engage with um, uh, those that uh, may be potentially and adversely affected. And there's certain, certain uh, uh, distances that they must notify and certain distances that they must notif uh, consult with uh, personal, personally consult with. So, and those are set out in the rule. 
Uh, the other rule is Rule 12, which is our noise control rule, which I talked about. And then the last one is Rule 24, which is rules respecting microgeneration. So those are the three primary rules that, uh, and, and it's mostly there for, for your reference. All right, next slide. So as part of the rules, uh, any, any applicant uh, must, uh, is required to consult with the, uh, the local jurisdiction. So that would include uh, the, the municipality and, uh, and they're required to not only consult with you, but in their application discuss any concerns that are raised by uh, the and, uh, and, and provide the specifics of the concerns, so the municipality and the steps taken to resolve those concerns. And, and in the end, whether those uh, concerns have been resolved. So, that, so that's part of the application that's filed, uh, uh, filed with the commission. The other aspect is uh, if it's a solar project, they must, uh, they must inform the uh, uh, municipality of any, uh, they, must they, they must prepare a solar glare report. And if there's glare predicted on local roadways, they must inform and consult with the local mis municipality on the results of that, uh, of that report and any glare that, uh, that could, uh, uh, Lastly, uh, as the as the commission is required to consider the uh, uh, regional land use plans, so must the uh, so must potentially be of concern the applicants in the in submitting their uh, uh, application to the AUC. All right, next slide, please. Sorry, next slide. So an area that is, uh, has been coming up lately with the uh, municipalities is uh, decommissioning and reclamation and uh, of, of projects uh, that, that get, a, get approved uh, as part of the uh, uh, that may overlap with a, uh, a land use plan or municipal development plan. And so we do have some requirements uh, through our rule to uh, that um, uh, reclamation is covered not by the AUC, but by uh, Alberta Environment or uh, Alberta uh, Environment and Protected Areas now. So, and that's, that's covered through the conservation and reclamation directive for renewable energy operations. So they have a directive that covers uh, the requirement conditioning and uh, the, the reclamation of a project at end of life. So, there, so those requirements are set out in that directive. Uh, as part of our requirements under rule seven, we also ask uh, that the operator uh, provide us with information will be sufficient funds available at the end of the project uh, to cover the costs of de around whether there are commissioning and reclamation. So the AUC has uh, no jurisdiction to, to require security. That would fall to uh, Alberta Environment. But, but part of our requirements is um, uh, is to, uh, to to get an understanding that uh, that they're thinking about and planning for the end of life of the project, and I provided there some some summary findings from from recent commission decisions, and uh, so so essentially the commission uh, is satisfied that existing project reclamation requirements are addressed through an app applicant's commitment to adhere to the directive itself. So. Uh, so as, as far as we, uh, as we take it currently, it's an issue that's in front of us. It's, it's something that we're looking at, uh, uh, in more detail. 
as it is it is uh, coming up uh, in in a number of uh, of concerns being raised by uh, by municipalities so so that's that's the basis of our requirements at this point next slide please and I, and I wanted to touch on as well just uh, in terms of how the commission views uh, or considers the uh, the land use planning, uh, the the bylaws, the structure plans, so the commission is not does not require require the applicant to um, uh, to, to to make sure it. How should I say this? It, it, it's um, energy projects do not have to meet all local land use planning, uh, but the the commission does consider that those plans in making its decision uh, because they they do reflect sort of the the counties or the municipalities views on how that land should be developed so this is it's very important for the municipalities to to bring this information forward to the commission to bring it uh as part of the uh as part of the record as part of the evidence that the commission must consider um in its in making its decision so one area where where there seems to be some confusion over is is whether the municipality is granted standing versus participation, and and so when the commission receives uh, statements of intent to participate, it will issue a standing ruling on whether uh, those parties can participate in the proceeding, and and that and that standing is really. Uh, comes down to a very specific case where it's it's uh, uh, persons that own own land within the within the uh, influence of that project uh, and and would re receive standing and standing really means that they could uh, they could trigger a hearing they're they're eligible to receive costs but that doesn't mean. Uh, if, you do, if a municipality does not receive standing because it doesn't own land in that area, it can still participate in the process. And often, and in, in, in almost all cases, the commission will grant participation rights for the, uh, for the county to bring forward its evidence. And uh, so even if uh, the, the municipality is not granted standing, it can still participate in the uh, commission's process, and I and I gave uh, I gave an example there uh, where uh, uh, where the county did did not own uh, lands that would be directly and adversely affected, but but was still granted the right to participate and bring its uh, its concerns forward to the commission. All right, next slide, please. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on uh, the uh, Municipal Government Act, uh, Section 619. Uh, and this does give uh, paramountcy to uh, the Commission's decisions over local planning authorities. Uh, but the important point here is that it only relates to issues that the commission's considered. So it doesn't involve uh, other things uh, like that, that fall to the, to the municipalities uh, purview, like provide, requiring them to, to obtain a development permit, road use agreements, fire safety, those all, all still remain with the municipality and generally are not uh, discussed in the decision uh, with the commission. So, uh, so 
So that's, I, I mean, I, I, I just wanted to, uh, to put that out there because I know that's, uh, that, that comes up and I'm sure that will be part of the, uh, the discussions that we'll have today. So that's, that's, uh, that's all I got for you in terms of a presentation. And now uh, I'll open it up to uh, questions. Um, I apologize if you, uh, if you uh, couldn't hear me that well. Okay, I think for the most part I came through. Thanks for that, Wayne. Uh, okay. Does the council have any questions? Uh, Holly, please go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Um, when you're talking about decommissioning and reclamation, and uh, can you define what ensuring sufficient funds mean? Because how do you know how much it's going to cost and be sufficient funds for the cleanup? So generally, um, that's that's an area where we're we're looking at uh, um, as part of uh, our review of Rule Seven to to get a better understanding. Uh, generally, what to, what an applicant will will give us is is that uh, these are uh, our private agreements with the landowners. And so we don't we don't have at this at this stage have a lot of uh, good information on sort of what those costs are, and uh, and it is covered off uh, by the uh, by private contractual agreements with the landowners. So that's that's an area we're we're looking to uh, uh, to consult further on and, and get a better understanding. So we the information we're getting is not at that sort of dollar cost level. So do you expect that there will be more regulations coming down and potentially establishment of something like an orphan well fund for cleanup? Is it heading in that direction? It, it is heading, well, it's, where it's heading is, is there will be some uh, additional consultations around that. Alberta Environment, in fact, is, uh, is looking at it uh, and uh, in terms of in terms of security for for those costs, but uh, so for us, if we're going to make changes, then we would uh, we would uh, propose some new requirements and and initiate a consultation process around that. Just a follow, I have a follow up question, and I refer to kind of your first slide uh, related to our mission, uh, your mission, and and also to follow up on the previous question around the cost and the responsibility for reclamation. And I realize you suggested that that goes back to Alberta environment, but the public interest, as you've indicated, is kind of at the confluence of three concentric circles, one being economic, one being social, and the other one being environmental. And I think from the public's point of view, and certainly from, and, and council as well, we are somewhat neutral on, on, on renewables, but, but uh, and, and from a tax base, they certainly provide a significant tax base that, that isn't there from bare land. However, uh, if the reclamation situation isn't well defined or well taken care of that has both you know that that influences all three of those circles social economic and environmental and i guess I mean, maybe this is outside your purview but but when i look at the economics how, how much what percentage i mean you you operate independently but what percentage or, or how would you balance the economic impact of say the void of, of uh, federal government regulation. I mean, much, much of the economics around this, I expect, is driven by, by legislation and incentives that come from the federal government. Uh, do you, I mean, that's probably outside of your area of purview, but I think it's something that concerns a lot of the public in terms of, of, of where we're going. I think we're very concerned that, that we don't create relics for our grandchildren on our landscapes and, and frankly the county is, is the front line of defense for what our landscape looks like and I think that's our concern and we don't say that to try to stop these things but there has been quite a confluence of them 
and and it's a concern to our that, that going forward this has an economic, social, and environmental positives to it. And and I would say that in recent years we've seen evidence of you know maybe not all the science is settled sometimes, and I, that probably also is in your area of purview. But I think I think it's pretty irrelevant to people who live on the land and in our communities. All that having said, notwithstanding wanting to protect the rights of individual landowners to do what they want to do, but if uh, there's nothing stopping a company from from uh, changing hands, uh, you know, it seems like a bit of a soft approach to me in terms of the recommendation just to, to talk about it, because uh, we've seen from the oil and gas activities where where you know a company that isn't doing so well can change hands, and all of a sudden you've, you've got uh, resources and, and infrastructure that falls into the orphan well fund. And I think that's a concern of, of ours. It doesn't have to stop the show, but, but until some of those answers are well understood by the public, we have concerns. That isn't a very concise question, but I think it covers a number of our concerns that can speak to. All right, let me, uh, let me start from the top. Uh, the um, so, so as, I, as I said in my presentation, there are requirements for decommissioning and reclaiming the land back to its original use as set out in, that, in the directive that I spoke to. So, so any, any operator uh, coming in and proposing a project and building a project and operating a project has to meet that and, and, does, and does commit to meeting those, that directive in its application. So, uh, and, and they're required under our approval process to, uh, to be clear that, uh, and they have to file the sort of the pre-assessment with us in terms of, of kicking that off. So, so that is, it is a dynamic process over the life of the project. So, so those requirements are there, they have to meet them. So if, if that's our starting point, uh, then, then the next step is well, does that cover off all all uh, all cases? Uh, if there's an insolvency, or if there's um, uh, uh, if a, if a if a company potentially walks away from from their project, so so the, so the, to, to answer that, they they do these are these are private landowners. Uh, that that negotiate with these companies, and part of that negotiation is to protect their land, and they they do require, as part of those those lease agreements, to uh, to address um, to address security. So, to the extent that we have insight into all of that, is we know it exists. We just don't have a lot of insight into what form it takes. And and so that's so that's where we would look to gain additional information. It, it's it's not that that protection doesn't exist. It's that we just we're not clear on on what form it takes. So so we're so so what's left over is again a, a, a percentage that's that's. Um, that we're protecting against is uh, is a small percentage, but it's not a zero. It's not a zero percent. It's uh, zero percent, zero pro probability. So, and in terms of the economics, uh, the um, I, I wasn't sure I caught all of that. But in terms of the economics, uh, from 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 Alberta's perspective, it's a it's an it's an open market. Uh, and, and generation, the economics of a uh, of a um, of generation uh, is is a risk based decision of the of the operator proposing it. It's, and the economics of the uh, of the project is is not considered uh, something the, the the commission considers. Okay. Thanks, Wayne. Unfortunately, we've kind of gone past our allotted time here, and we do have another delegation or another presentation following yours. But I'm going to suggest that we maybe re-engage re with further questions and discussion 
uh, on an go forward basis. Is that a reasonable approach for council? We, we do need to move on to our next uh, um, uh, presentation. So thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate that. And I'm sure we'll have some follow-up questions as well. Uh, and I realize that not all of them might be answered because some of them might be outside your areas of pertinent, but they're, they're pertinent questions in any case. So thank you for the presentation. All right. Well, well, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, certainly willing to uh, to engage in the future should you uh, have additional questions. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our next uh, presentation from the Alberta Renewable Energy Association, and uh, welcome Evan Wilson. Evan, can you hear us? Are you connected? I see you there. Good. Thank you. Go ahead. And as yes, indicated earlier, we do have a have a, a large delegation. So, if you uh, rep or, uh, audience listening to you this morning, so if you can speak clearly into your mic and uh, keep your volume up, we'd appreciate it. Thanks. Great, uh, excellent. Well, can everybody hear me right now and see my slides up on the screen? Okay, it's 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 you're not loud and clear, but you we we can hear you if we strain. So go ahead. We, Can you hear us, Evan? Have we lost connection, Todd? I can. I can still see Evan. Mike is open. I'm not sure. I can see his presentation. I guess I can't see him anymore. Evan, are you still with us? Evan, uh, Evan says he can hear us, and when we tried it yesterday at work, uh, he's just going to log back in here real quick and uh, see if the turn it off, turn it on again system works. Okay, we, could, we could hear him when he was talking right at the other side. It was just a little bit muted, but it was better than what we've got now. Are you able to hear me now? Check. Yeah. One, two. Yeah, yeah that's it. Go ahead. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you for having me. I'm going to... Uh, relaunch my presentation here. If you just give me one moment, uh, share my screen. Apologies for that. We we even tested this out yesterday, so unfortunately, I don't know uh, what's different. But uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak here today. Uh, Want to thank the Alberta Utilities Commission for also um, leading us in the conversation here. My name is Evan Wilson. I am the Senior Director for Western Canada with the Canadian Renewable Energy Association. We're a relatively new association. Um, we are a result of the merger between the Canadian Wind Energy Association and the Canadian Solar Industries Association. Uh, this merger happened in 2020, and now we represent large-scale utility, uh, wind and solar and energy storage, as well as distributed and residential storage uh, and, and wind and solar. So wanted to give uh, a brief overview of, of our members, our activities in Alberta, and then kind of get to the more um, pointed uh, uh, conversation or question about, um, you know, about the permitting and reclamation process that our members undergo. So here is a, uh, an overview of, of the number of members and the members that we do have active in our Alberta working groups that are actively developing or supporting or operating projects here in Alberta. Um, Alberta currently home to 45 wind energy projects, uh, which totals 2,600 megawatts or so of installed wind capacity. We have a total of about 16,000 megawatts of total capacity in our electricity system, um, and 2,600 of that comes from wind. 
Solar, we have about 24 utility scale solar projects for a total of 1,000 megawatts of solar. Um, that's up from under 100 megawatts in 2019. So we've seen a lot of growth of wind, or sorry, of solar specifically here in Alberta. So always happy to, you know, come speak to uh, folks like yourselves to to talk about, um, you know, the changes and 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 what we're seeing with solar uh, in Alberta. If you take a look at these maps. Um, the maps give an idea of where the resource is for both of these technologies. Anywhere where the map is is red, yellow, or orange, that's the best wind resource or the best solar resource in all of Canada. So as you can see, they're they're pretty well aligned, and and Newell fits really in the midst of um, you know where we have second to none solar and second to none wind. Um, you know, wind opportunity here. And why, on top of the, 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 um, the opportunity that comes from the resource, we also have a real opportunity because of Alberta, we, we call it the Alberta Advantage. You've probably heard that before, but there's really three reasons on top of the, the wind and solar resource that, that people are working here in Alberta. One, like Wayne talked about, um, we have a, a deregulated market where projects move forward based on risks that private investors are willing to take. Um, we have the tier uh, regulation from the provincial government that sets a carbon price for large emitters. Large emitters are able to buy renewable credits from wind and solar facilities to reduce their carbon tax, um, you know, their ca carbon tax exposure from the provincial government. And then we have a transmission regulation that permits uh, generation and users of power to locate anywhere they, they would like to locate in the province. And that allows our members to go into long term, we're talking 10, 15, 20 year agreements where the power and these credits are purchased um, directly from them. And why are these so, uh, why are these so, so popular um, to buy the power? And it's really the power that comes from wind and solar is very, very low cost um, compared to other types of, of power generation out there. These graphs come from an organization called Lazard that does financial reporting about uh, uh, power deals. Um, if you look on the left, that is a graph of how much wind energy prices have fallen in the last 10 mm -hmm. years. We're looking at a decrease of about 70%. On solar, we're looking at decreases of 90% for the price of solar over the last 10 years. So these, these technologies are becoming very mainstream. The prices are falling and they are becoming um, a very much of interest from buyers who wish to buy low cost green power over, like I say, this 10, 15, 20 year period. This graph uh, here is from the Alberta context. This is some research that was done in 2023. Right now, you can buy wind from a wind farm, wind energy for about five cents per kilowatt hour. If you were to buy that from a gas plant directly, you would be buying it for about six cents per kilowatt hour. Solar is also at uh, six cents per kilowatt hour like natural gas, so very competitive with natural gas. Those prices are going to be falling over the next 12 to 15 years down to five cents per kilowatt hour for solar down to three cents per kilowatt hour for wind. We're seeing these prices in Alberta because of our resource <clears throat> drop a lot. This graph here shows the amount of agreements that are being signed between power buyers and uh, those that are generating from wind and solar. Since 2019, we've seen about 2200 or 2100 megawatts rather of these corporate purchase agreements that have been signed in this province. Part of the reason we're seeing so much growth in solar is because you've got businesses that are buying directly from solar facilities. They're buying directly from wind facilities. Who's buying this power? Well, here is a slide that shows the off takers for a lot of, of this power that is being purchased directly here in Alberta. You have large uh, uh, oil sands uh, uh, facility owners such as CNRL and Synovus who are buying uh, this to, to reduce their overall emissions. You have organizations like Amazon, Microsoft, Scotiabank that are responding to 
the pressures from their shareholders to decarbonize their electricity. So really just wanted to emphasize this. There was the comment earlier about whether or not this was something that was you know, happening for uneconomic reasons. And what we're seeing is um, the marketplace is really interested in buying renewable power and Alberta is the only place you can do it. So Alberta is getting the benefits of this. And what does that mean? A 100 megawatt wind farm is about 175 million in investment and 300 job years of construction. Solar uh, for 100 megawatts is about 125 million in investment and 200 full-time jobs. That 100 megawatt uh, renewable facility provides, and you know, this is a rough estimate across the whole province, but for every 100 megawatts, you're talking about a million dollars in property taxes for the host communities. The landowner agreements that were referred to earlier, 100 megawatts leads to about $500,000 annually for the landowners that that go into these agreements. So it really is, um, you know, there, there really is opportunity in the province coming from these long-term agreements with power buyers. Uh, I won't dwell too long on this slide um, because Wayne did talk a lot about this, but you know, this is a very uh, mature and well-regulated sector. Rule seven is the application rule that, that uh, the AUC has that includes um, uh, public, uh, public uh, participation requirements, noise control, which sets the level of noise that comes from a wind or a solar farm and, and, and serves as a de facto setback. Rule 33 is post-approval environmental monitoring that the AUC may also require. And these are supported by Alberta Environment and Parks uh, or par uh, Environment and Protected Areas rules around wildlife directives for wind and solar to ensure minimum, uh, minimal impacts on wildlife and, and native species, as well the Conservation and Reclamation Directive, which Wayne did talk about, that requires preparation of reclamation plans. It requires engagement with landowners to ensure that there is a plan for reclamation. And that is requires, uh, um, you know, that requires ratings from environment and parks, as well as approval uh, from the, the AUC. The Alberta Electric System Operator is another regulator here that deals with the interconnection process and manages the sale of power. One thing that I would also just emphasize here Wayne uh, mentioned about how, how these land agreements are private agreements. And just want to remind folks that renewable energy does not fall under Surface Rights Act. Land access is voluntary. And that makes these landowner agreements really critical because if landowners are not comfortable with the commitments made about conservation and reclamation, if they're not comfortable with the commitments that are made to some sort of financial security, the landowner has the opportunity to say no to the development. The landowner has the opportunity to reject this private agreement. And um, you know, we encourage landowners that are not happy with the level of security or the level um, of, of commitment that is made to, to not sign these agreements. So to talk about the, the end of life management here, um, there's two ways that this can be thought of. The first way is that wind and solar projects at the end of their life the only option is not decommissioning and reclamation. There's also the option to repower and upgrade the site. So, you know, these sites typically last for, for 20, 25, or 30 years. After 20, 25, or 30 years, you may have to replace the older wind turbines, solar panels. You may have to, to replace some of the technology, but the wind resource and the solar resource remains the connection to the electricity grid for the sale of electricity remains, the access roads for maintenance and construction remain. Um, in the case uh, of solar, they're, they're at the end of life, there may also be uh, elements from the foundations that remain. And hopefully what our members are, are trying to do is ensure that the, the relationships with the landowners and communities remain so that there continues to be the social license to rebuild and repower with new more efficient turbines and new more efficient uh, solar panels um, maybe taller towers can be put in place better blades can be put in place and the a new wind farm a new solar farm can be built where the old one was built um, so repowering is typically um, you know something that is considered a lot of the time or will be considered a lot of the time we haven't seen a lot of 
um, projects getting to that age where reclamation or repowering is a choice, but provided that there are healthy foundations and components on the site, uh, the economics of the power being generated on site and new technology do allow developers and operators not to move on once a project comes to the end of life. They have the opportunity to replace the technology and build a whole new uh, wind or solar farm. However, there may be cases where it is required to decommission and reclaim uh, and remove the project and then return the land to its original state via reclamation. Again, the conservation and reclamation requirement um, says what that, excuse me, what that level of reclamation looks like, what the standard of reclamation looks like and puts liability in place for several years after reclamation to ensure that reclamation has, has taken and, and we are seeing a return to the original state. Decommissioning consists of dismantling the, the site by extracting the recyclable materials like steel, concrete, and glass. Those can then be sold on, on the, uh, you know, on commodity markets um, in order to fund part of the reclamation of the site and the conservation of the site, and then properly disposing or recycling other comp components in compliance with other requirements. The standards for this are very stringent for reclamation in Alberta, um, but as 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 uh, we've talked about, there are no uh, requirements for bonding uh, yet um, in in Alberta. There's nothing quite like the um, you know orphan wells fund that would apply to wind and solar. But doing a survey of our members over the last several weeks, um, it it is the case that a large majority of our members directly provide security to landowners in the form of bonds, letters of credit, cash escrow, or other forms of financial assurance that are the result of these negotiations um, between the landowner themselves uh, and the, the developer. If the landowner doesn't like what they're getting in terms of this financial security, which there are a variety of different approaches to this, but if the landowner isn't happy with it, they can ask for something that makes them more comfortable with it. Um, or if they don't like what the alternatives are, there is really the opportunity to um, reject the, the contract and reject the project on, on their lands. So happy to take more uh, questions and, and have more conversation about this. I know there's uh, not a ton of time left, but um, happy to, to take any questions and, and we'll put my email up here on the screen if there was any follow-up that, uh, that folks hey. wanted to engage in. Thanks for the time. Thanks for your presentation, Evan. Uh, good information there. I appreciate that. Um, just ask. We do. Are, we are tight for time, but we'll take some couple questions from council if there are. Okay. Holly, go ahead, please. Hello. I'm just curious about the recycling of solar panels. Um, one of my sons just did a uh, did some research into it for a school essay, and his research said the cost to recycle a solar panel costs between twelve and twenty five dollars, and the material. The value of the material recovered was three dollars. So I'm just wondering how you're keeping them out of landfills when the cheapest option is to put them in a landfill as opposed to recycling them. So we are, um, you know, we are working on um, practices, the best practices on how to affordably and uh, more affordably recycle solar panels. We understand that this is something that does require work. And certainly given some of the supply chain issues that are being, um, you know, being experienced by members and being experienced by anyone who needs to get any raw materials, there really is an interest in figuring out how to better recycle and reuse what goes into the solar panels so that we can develop our own, um, you know, local um, or national supply chains for solar energy. This is something, like I say, it is a work in progress. Um, the solar energy sector in Canada is relatively new. We have not seen, um, you know, we have not seen a, a large mass of projects yet that are coming into the age where reclamation, conservation, and um, and recycling plans are um, being executed. So, so uh, you know, I, I do acknowledge, yes, there is a gap on, in the recycling, but we do have... Um, you know, we do have the coming decade or so to figure out how best to do that. Um, we are quite active on that, and I would be happy to share a fact sheet, um, 
you know, whether for council or for anyone that is, um, you know, researching this, uh, you know, we can we can share it with council so you can understand the measures that are being taken to close that gap. Okay, thanks, Evan. Uh, we're really tight for time. I have one more question, and we do have a large uh, representation from the public here today that I think will have some questions. I'm not quite sure how to handle that. I'm wondering if we should follow up with another meeting and take questions uh, somehow from the public to us because we are short of time. I had one other question though with regard to slide six. What is included in the definition sure. of unsubsidized? And what would the market, uh, uh, follow up to that, what would the market look like without uh, uh, federally imposed carbon taxes in the system? So what would the pricing look like? I mean, we see this here with, uh, with okay, slide seven. I beg your pardon? Uh, what, what is included in, in the definition of unsubsidized in slide, slide six? And then I think... Right. So, so the definition of unsubsidized, and I should be clear, these are, these are, this is illustrative of the fall of prices in the U.S. Um, uh, around wind and, and solar. Um, if you're looking for more appropriate, these are also unsubsidized costs on slide seven for Alberta. And really, this is the cost that if projects are moving forward, they are taking the risk to go onto the grid. Um, absent any um, you know, support from the provincial government, absent any large uh, contracts from the federal government, this is the cost that it takes to deliver electricity from the, uh, from the facility itself and deliver it to the grid. Um, while continuing to operate the facility with, with um, you know, with the, the return on investment that's required for operations. So this is absent any, any contracts or subsidies coming from, from government. Okay, thanks, Evan. Uh, we're kind of at the end of our time here, but I appreciate your presentation. I know there will be some follow-up questions further, and uh, as per our agenda, we have committed to having a question period for council with the public, we appreciate you coming. I think it's it's uh, an indication of concern uh, and 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 interest in what's happening. As as we are as well, our our, our interest is in, in doing what's good for our our future collectively and together. So uh, with that, thank you for the presentation, both both to ABC and and Evan with the Renewables uh, Association. And with that, I'm going to open it for just a few minutes to questions. If, if the public has, has some questions for council that we can forward. I, in terms of process, I see us being able to engage with AUC and the renewables organization that made presentations today. And, and our interest is to find good answers to the questions that you, that you have as well. That's, that's part of the process that, that we're interested in here today. So, if you have questions for council that we can forward or that are directly for council, please come up. There's a mic uh, at the table here, uh, and, and, and we'd welcome your questions. Not guaranteeing we can answer them all today, but, but uh, find a process to move forward. Any questions? Please, come on, take a, take a seat at the mic here. And just identify your, your name again and then, and then uh, go ahead. Thanks. Thank you. My, na My name is Terry Dahl. I was born in Brooks. I grew up on a farm in Rolling Hills. I learned to drive a tractor and pull calves. When irrigating, I learned how to ride a motorbike and carry a shovel at the same time. My husband and I have raised our kids on an acreage outside of Duchess, and we call it our little slice of heaven. Twice recently in the Brooks Bulletin, Mr. Tiffin and Mr. Fenske had a chance to answer my questions regarding the County of Newell's MDP plan. My questions were not hard, but they were still unanswered. I, for one, did not receive a letter about MDP reviews. It is my opinion that County of Newell did not do their due diligence and engaging with the taxpayers. You can see from the social media engagement is extremely low, which should signify a need to do more. The bylaws affect every single one of us living in the county, not just the 10 top rate pay payers' businesses. 
Not all farmers and ranchers or working people have time to see what's trending on Twitter and Facebook. I recently found out that other provinces are doing the same all across Canada, reviewing their land use bylaws. Outside Edmonton, Thorhill County was going to extreme measures by mandating permits for simple barbed wire fences and counting the shrubs and chickens on your property. One county in Barrie, Ontario wanted to charge you by your size of driveway and the amount of drainage going down the street while making it illegal to collect rainwater. Holding officials accountable in their elected positions has become a full-time job for the taxpayer. The County of Newell has been no different. While my concerns are many, for now I'll keep it simple to the document in question. Why were the words United Nations on the MDP document to begin with? Where did they come from? How did the quote, the earlier the county makes the transition away from dependence on fossil fuels, the better. How did that quote pass a CAO and councillor's approval to even land on the document? They were sure quickly removed. Deleting words does not change intentions. Revising county land use bylaws needs public engagement. Deleting words and expecting ratepayers to just forget about it is not going to happen. Why would Mr. Fenske of the County of Newell even use the word conspiracy when all indicators came straight from the County of Newell in their own words? The United Nations, the County of Newell's own MDP document, no one made that up. Right on the United Nations website, you'll find Agenda 2030 that has been accelerated worldwide. There is no conspiracy when it's in plain sight on the UN's own website for everyone to see. People just have to take the time to look. Mr. Fenske, you put United Nations on your own document. I want to know why. Also noticed on the MDP document, right under the solar heading, was mention of the Mustakis Institute. According to the county's own website, the county of Newell has partnered with the Mustakis Institute and on its own website, by admission, is committed to the United Nations and the 2015 UN Conference on Climate Change. The United Nations was on the document for everyone to see. It would still be there if I were silent. The work on the County of Newell's engineer for the MDP plan is ISL Engineering. While the county has recently been awarded for the financial report, I could not find ISL engineering listed anywhere in the reports, nor could I find the Mustakis Institute. How much is ISL engineering contract with the county of Newell? And the Mustakis Institute, I would assume, would be a membership at minimum. That shouldn't be hard to find. In this area, in this era of transparency, a, a taxpayer should be easily find the expenses for the County of Newell. ISL Engineering, on their own Twitter account, supports UNESCO and the United Way, which are both entities of the United Nations. Do you know all the County of Newell's top eighth ratepayer, Core for Oil Core, has recently been sold to IPC, the International Petroleum Corporation, a direct partner of the United Nations Global Compact a huge supporter of the United Nations and the 15-minute cities they are doing in Edmonton. All three indicators in regards to the United Nations came straight from the County of Newell themselves. Is the County of Newell knowingly doing business with the United Nations? That is a yes or no question that deserves an answer. Justin Trudeau wants to phase out the oil sands. We all heard him say it. My last question for both Mr. Fenske and Mr. Forrest is a question everyone should be asking you. I love my Alberta home in rural county of Newell. I have been a ratepayer my whole life. How long have you been a county ratepayer? Thank you for your presentation and for your, for your concerns. Uh, Matt, do you have some comments? I, I mean, the, the yes and no, the answer to the yes and no question is no. There's, there's, there, there's, uh, there's nothing happening between the county and the United Nations. However, we don't control uh, what they put out there. Matt, do you have any comments? 
Yeah, I appreciate the uh, comments and the criticisms. Uh, I think it's always important to uh, understand that anything printed in the paper is typically just the news bites. Um, when it comes to uh, why would I use conspiracy, um, that's what it looked like folks were, were seeing. Is they thought that the county had signed on to a United Nations Agenda 2030, which this is the first time I've heard about it. It's on your document. Yeah, so I'll speak to uh, why would the county, why would the CAO, why would council let a document get published? It's a simple reference. Um, the topic sheets that went out were intended to go out to the public to hopefully engage the community in a conversation. I'd say they weren't. Uh, this is the most engaged I've seen the community uh, for a very long time. Uh, the MDP, to be clear, already exists. We have an MDP at the County of Newell. Uh, we have eight new councillors around the table, and it's time for a refresh. It's over a decade old. Uh, the part of engaging the public, this, this is it. It's ongoing. So the first draft is in uh, in development, when we receive that and it's vetted, it'll be kicked out to the public and you'll have another opportunity to, uh, to comment on it. Um, and I think this is the valuable part of a democracy, is giving audience and being able to hear some of this feedback, because I can guarantee you there's nobody around this table who's interested in signing on to any uh, United Nations agenda, Nobody around this table is interested in seeing oil and gas tank. It's not an interest. Um, there is a reality that the county faces. Um, it comes down to money. It, it costs money to provide services, to pave roads, to provide utilities at a subsidized rate. Um, and for context, it was in Sandy's paper. We have lost $570 million of assessment. So at last year's tax rates, that means another five million dollars for the community. So it's community halls in Scandia. It's paving the road out to the aqueduct, if that's part of the vision. It's building the trail out to Kimbrook Island. Like those are real priorities that the community has, and you need dollars to do it. Um, so in the meantime, you have a council today who's very invested in economic development and trying to attract some new industry to uh, to our area and support the folks who are already here. Um, so I'm not sure if you were paying attention. Uh, last meeting, council gave first reading to a tax incentive bylaw to draw non-residential development here. And they're not looking at picking winners and losers. Uh, oil and gas, doors open. Renewables, doors open. Uh, hopefully, you actually attract some jobs along with, with that development. So. Um, my comment on conspiracy was not intended to inflame or offend, uh, but I think there's a lot of things that are getting taken out of context here, to be honest. Um, we've talked about land use by We're not looking at our land use by law right now. Uh, that's in place. We're looking at the municipal development plan. So we'd encourage folks, get online, fill out the survey, uh, good, bad, or ugly. Like, we're, we're happy to be critiqued. Like it, it's valuable for us to receive the criticism, so I appreciate you uh, coming out today and sharing that. I think I'll just add to that too that the municipal development plan has not been changed. As as Matt indicated, it's been in place for many years, but it is time to review it. And what has happened to this point is is not even first steps towards uh, towards changing it. It's 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 a, it's out there for public public comment. What what would we like to see from a municipal development plan, which is a high level, a high level regulatory uh, document that, that, that uh, guides council and residents with regard to how we want to see our landscape develop. So I think it's positive. I want to express appreciation for the concerns that people have raised. I think we're all concerned about a lot of the same things. I think that uh, what's happening internationally is a concern to us out of our control. But, but where we can influence it, we need to. And we need to do that in, with pro proper process and, and through the various levels of government. So uh, I can say that this council uh, is engaged with other levels of other municipalities and the provincial government uh, where we can to, to 
uh, represent the concerns of our ratepayers and ensure that our countryside develops in a way that, that, that is good for future generations. And at the same time, I mean, there is, and I think that's been spoken to a number of times this morning, the, the, the importance of, of uh, protecting landowners' rights to develop as they would like to do that. But again, without, without compromising the interests of the rest of society, of the, of, of the environment, and also, also the, uh, the social and economic interests that we all have, and ensuring that when these, uh, when, when changes occur and new technology is developed, it's done from a holistic perspective. Let's not just like let's make sure we're looking at the full cost of, of, of what's gone into into uh, initiatives that have happened, and and keep an open mind with regard to how how we move forward productively and with an eye to the future, but protecting the things that all of us appreciate from from uh, a, a, a long investment in resources in this area. I mean, our tax base is remarkably better than it would be without the long development of, of, of oil and gas activity and the continued uh, development of that. And, I, and I'll add both, and that's relatively new to this council, but, but uh, all of the new activity that's happening with regard to oil and gas activity that you see around us. And if you get up early in the morning, you see lights uh, that you didn't see for a few years. But none of that activity is assessed in terms of our assessment base uh, because of a, a, a holiday that has been given to them. And I, you know, that, that's, that was what it was, but we think that needs to be reviewed so that those new initiatives and those, that new infrastructure gets the tax base and, and, and continues to contribute to uh, all of our property tax generation. So um, we're sure we, we, we've got to move on, but uh, it, you had your hand up for one more comment or question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, where do I find information with regards to ISL engineering? Uh, Matt, can you? So we're looking for a, a, how much business the county does with ISL engineering? Okay, we, we can uh, we can surface some information. And the Mistakis Institute. Mistakis Institute, I, I'm not familiar that we've got anything going with the Mistakis. That must have been a reference as well, Jeff. Yeah, currently I don't think we have anything going on with the Mistakis Institute. Um, historically, we were involved in a study that took place, I want to say, about seven or eight years ago to do at least conflict lands. What that was, uh, was a study taking a look at the landscape, the oil and gas development, the agriculture, and looking at what lands may be least impacted from the development of renewable energy developments. Um, that was a, a panel group that, that the county did have some members sit on with the Mistakis Institute, but nothing in recent memory that we've uh, been involved with there. Okay. How long have you been a taxpayer? How long have you been a rate payer? Me? Mr. Kensky. How long have I been a rate payer for the county? Yeah. I'm no longer a rate payer for the county. I was a rate payer for a couple of years when I lived on a beautiful acreage outside of the Duchess. Okay. Yeah, I can assure you that all of the Councillors are right there. <laughs> Most of us for all of our lives. So, <laughs> go ahead. Hi, I'm Colette Sieber Ricky. Um, I didn't plan on talking, so I'm hoping that I will not be too all over the place. Um, I've been a rate payer in the county of Newell for 25 years. I've seen a lot of changes. Um, I feel that it is my duty as a, a ratepayer, a citizen of Canada, and a human being on this earth that we start paying attention to what is going on in this, in this world. And I must say, uh, I kind of set back a little bit. Um, I've, I've, I've always stepped in. I, we have had issues in our around our acreages we live by meadows golf course we've had expansion of the huge power lines 
We've had a fill dirt pit. We've, we contend with lakeside constantly and the odor and a gas plant. And so when these solar panels came up, I have to admit, uh, and they sent us the first um, notice or whatever when they applied for this in castles and I thought, well, it's not in my backyard so I don't need to worry about it this time. And then all of a sudden, in October, I got another notice of application from the AUC. And it was in my backyard. It's like in my backyard. It'll be directly south of me. And I thought, how did this happen? How did I miss this? So I asked everyone around our acreages, did you get some kind of a notice? Because uh, I mean, we all get busy, I get it. And they all went, well, no, I didn't get one. I mean, I'm, we're, we're a close-knit community at Snyder Subdivision, and we support each other all the way. All the way, we help each other out. If someone breaks a leg, we're there. So I was a little shocked about that. And now, today, sitting here and listening to AUC and this mm, some kind of, sounds like a lobby group to me, quite frankly, for solar and wind, I am shocked. The first thing I'm shocked about <laughs> is that AUC doesn't have specifics on reclamation. Does that not put up big flags for you guys? How can you put the cart before the horse on this issue? When there is such a huge demand for solar and wind, every time I go down the 36, there's another huge propeller going down the highway. Where is this going to go when this all falls apart? And it will fall apart. Because in Europe already, they don't know how, they, they gotta get rid of their old solar panels. And that, where is that gonna go? Europe is even more crowded and has less room than Canada. Where is all that lithium gonna go, people? Does this not raise flags for you? I'm gonna be a grandma. <laughs> I didn't. I never thought I would have to fight for my unborn grandchild's life. And I'm worried. I'm very worried. And I pray to God that the county, that this county and all the counties across Alberta get their autonomy back to make decisions for the ratepayers in this county and all counties. That we, we have set back as ratepayers for far too long. We, we left it in your hands. And I am encouraged by the questions from you guys today. And I hope you have our backs because I am worried. I'm worried about the oil and gas industry. I'm worried about where this is going with all these solar farms. Where are they gonna put this? Where are they gonna put it when it goes, when it falls apart? And they wanna, they wanna keep putting, bringing in new technology the cart is before the horse in this whole situation. They push solar and they didn't even know how to get rid of the panels. Are you freaking kidding me? Sorry for that, but I'm upset. Thank you. I think. Uh, we have similar concerns and, and, and I think those have been voiced. We have, we have so we raised those concerns at the Rural Municipalities Association. We've recently joined with the Rocky View Council with the, uh, County on an initiative, an initiative to get better act, uh, understanding and also direction with regard to reclamation because that is a concern. Huge. And I think I think that uh, it probably goes further than that. So we appreciate your concern, appreciate your engagement today. Unfortunately, we're running up against the clock. And a couple of us are going to celebrate a 96th birthday party. It's just, just over noon. It's a short deal, but it's important. And it's important for all of the reasons that I think you've come here today to ensure that our future looks as good as our past has been. And, we, and, and we're committed to that. It's going to look different than it did. We, but, but we're open to that, too. We just want it to be uh, done 
economically and, and with our future in mind and the future of our grandkids. A few of us are, all of us around this table are concerned about the same thing. We're so, asking for your protection. Yeah, well, and we and need you to have we'll, our back. We'll do what we, we can. Uh, and we share the, some of the frustration you have with regard to what's coming from higher levels of government at some point. So uh, with that, I'm going to adjourn us for lunch. Thank you for all of your participation. And uh, we ran short of time with regard to questions for AUC and the previous uh, uh, presentation. So if I'm going to invite you to, if you have questions, get them to us somehow through, the, through, the, uh, through email or, or, or direct contact with with, with some of us, but uh, our interest is in is ensuring that development happens in an orderly way, in a way that that is good for our residents, recognizing that that uh, we won't always all agree on everything. But uh, that's that's a dynamic that, that we've always lived with too. So we're here to to represent you and thank you for your presentation here this morning. Thank you. We'll reconvene at uh, 1.30, I suggest, okay?